Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Current Issues, and thank you for folks who are joining us here in person and folks who are joining us online. Uh, once again, my name is Jagadish Abdevashri Dekas. I use he pronouns. I'm research faculty here and the associate director of the Institute. So I just want to start off today's program by just saying a little bit about the Institute, and then I'll introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Kapteen Blair. So ISTU was founded in 2015 as the first university-wide in the student country focusing exclusively on research to prove that alcohol well being of sexual of the sexual and gender minority community, and the largest institute in the world researching LGBTQ health. As a university-wide institute in Northwestern here, our mission is to connect scholars with numerous disciplines from numerous disciplines with the SGM community to forge collaborations and stimulate innovative research to improve SGM health and well-being. We provide opportunities for high-level research and training for the next generation of SGM scholars and disseminate information to the SGM community. Um, and the wider public, practitioners, scientists, and policymakers. Our current issues in LGBTQ health le uh, lecture series, which is what I'm here for today, focuses on highlighting important research done in the field of LGBTQ health, such as today's talk by Dr. Christine Wood, which is entitled, Progress Towards Broadening Participation of LGBTQ Plus People in STEM. So, now it is my pleasure to introduce um, an esteemed colleague of mine, Dr. Christine Wood. Hi, Christine. <laughs> uh, who I, you know, I'm going to share their bio, but I could say a lot more about them having uh, worked with them on numerous projects. Uh, Dr. Wood, in his day, she programs, is a research assistant professor in the Department of Medical Social Sciences and here at ISTU. Um, and uh, currently, she is on detail at the National Science Foundation, serving as a senior advisor to the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the past decade. Their research has focused primarily on barriers to, to inclusion and, and STEM fields. And her current position, and her current position at NSF, she is working to advance equity for sexual and gender minorities in the federal scientific workplace by focusing on the urgent need for data on the experiences of SGM people in STEM. So I have learned so much over the last couple of years collaborating and working with Dr. Wu, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jagadisha. It's so wonderful to see your face. And thank you, Andrew and Jagadisha, for the work you've put in um, to let this event happen. And thank you all for attending this event. I am so grateful to be back in the presence of my wonderful Ishtim colleagues. And um, as you know, in August, I began a rotator position at the National Science Foundation, where I have had the wonderful privilege to work with the team in the office of the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, which is led by Dr. Charles Barber. Um, and I've learned so much in these past four months that I hope I can parlay some of that into use it together with some of the academic research I'll be reviewing. Um, I have the immense privilege in that new position at NSF to be leading efforts around the collection of SOGI, sexual and gender, sexual orientation and gender identity data in federal surveys. I'll use the acronym SOGI from here on out. Um, and I want to highlight my own and others' research on barriers and facilitators to participation for sexual and gender minorities um, pursuing or currently in STEM careers and highlight some things I've been able to wor uh, learn from my wonderful colleagues at the National Science Foundation as well, um, give some directions on both academic and um, federal government research and efforts to promote inclusion for LGBTQI plus scientists and federal employees. I'll start off by sharing, oops, no. Uh, the groundswell of testimonies and demands for more data over the past several years from researchers and LGBTQI plus identified scientists. Some like our director, Brian Mustansky, have graciously shared their experiences with homophobia and exclusion in academic research science and others have simply highlighted the need for more data and more research on STEM disparities facing LGBTQI plus individuals in STEM and the federal workforce and education environments in general. So today I want to start off by highlighting what we do know. I use these puzzle pieces purposely because we actually, when we pull all the research together on 
SGM inequities, barriers and facilitators to participation in STEM, it really is like pulling puzzle pieces together. I would not say at this point that we have a really coherent field um, that's congealed around this, um, around LGBTQI plus disparities in STEM. Some of that has to do with barriers imposed by funding resources, and some of it has to do with um, challenges within the research community on getting people to pay attention to this issue, frankly. So I'll tell you what we do know, I'll tell you what we don't know, and then I'll go through some of the current research and efforts going on within the academic space as well as in the federal government. What we do know, SGM STEM students and professionals experience lots of interest in pursuing STEM. Um, some of the research that I'll show you today really does highlight that there is a captive interest among sexual and gender minority researchers, students, scientists in making contributions and valuable contributions to science. Um, we also know that there are documented higher rates of sexual harassment, career limitations, perceived career limitations and actual um, concrete structural limitations, as well as the perception of being devalued among sexual and gender minority researchers and scientists. Um, we know there's documented data on the increased likelihood of leaving STEM training and careers among sexual and gender minorities and a decreased sense of belonging in STEM learning environments. I do have a plethora of citations here and many of these folks that I'm providing links to participated in our symposium and think tank in June um, on SGM and broadening participation um, in science for SGM individuals. So we pull together all of this research. It's sort of a crude meta-analysis here of what we know right now. We also know, and I know this from forming relationships in the federal government over these past several months, that people are willing to answer questions about sexual orientation and gender identity in national surveys and qualitative interviews, but our best practices need revision and there needs to be an overall spotlight on um, SOGI data. Um, people don't tend to see SOGI questions as being more sensitive than other demographic questions. However, it's SGM respondents who often encounter questions on surveys and in interviews that don't align with their identities and experiences. So this brings us to the need for this research and research in interventions and SGM researchers to play a role in how best practices around surveys and questions about SOGI in surveys are constructed. I've had the great privilege of working with uh, Ray Ellis at Census, um, who has done a substantial amount of research on how people perceive SOGI questions in surveys, um, the American Community Survey and others that the Census puts out. And um, they're the one that kind of um, highlighted this for me that people are willing to answer SOGI questions and it's sexual and gender minorities, LGBTQI plus individuals who do encounter challenges when completing these surveys. So I'm gonna move on now to talk about why we don't know more. There's a complex set of problems. Um, I wanna highlight what is going on. The Biden administration has done well to put out a call for more research on um, SGM's experience in the federal government and in science to improve the environments in which LGBTQI plus people are working. Um, there's an executive order, um, sorry, that's a, a premature preview of the next bit, an executive order on the need for SOGI data and federal surveys. Um, there's a call for a federal evidence agenda on SOGI, where uh, people at agencies are being asked to collect data on their employees um, to gauge the experiences of LGBTQI people in agencies. And um, there is a scientific integrity framework that's been published that acknowledges this need. So what are some of the challenges in getting this actually done? Um, the first, and I would say the big glaring issue here is that national STEM surveys uh, fail to include SOGI. Um, so the gold standard survey of um, doctoral dissertation recipients, um, their career plans, and their demographic um, information is the surveys put out by the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, NCSES. They are housed within NSF. 
after a lot of pressure and groundswell of pressure to actually pursue this data, they are piloting um, SOGI data in their survey of earned doctorates. For those of you who have PhDs, you will have been asked, or you will be asked if you're getting a PhD, to fill out the survey of earned doctorates upon completion and uploading into ProQuest of your dissertation. So you've probably seen it before. Um, they're piloting a battery of questions on SOGI in their current surveys, as well as the sur or the one that's coming up next year. Right now, they're actively piloting SOGI questions on their survey of doctoral recipients. So we'll know more in the next year what comes back from the SDR. Um, we'll know if they actually intend to pursue SOGI data in the future. As of now, there is no real commitment to retain or incorporate SOGI data. So we're kind of at the mercy of, of their efforts at the moment. Um, and I've heard from some folks um, who've gone through pilot surveys with NCSES and, and other attempts to collect federal data on um, SOGI that there is a little bit of pushback around including SOGI data because there's this claim that SOGI questions perform worse than other measures in pilots. Um, and those might be that all demographic questions perform worse than questions about when you got your PhD and what field you got your PhD in. Um, other demographic uh, areas like um, SES, socioeconomic status, um, immigration status, and race also perform pretty there's, there's a lot of missing da data that come out um, on those questions. So I wouldn't say there's really any evidence that SOGI perform any worse than other demographic questions. So I would keep that critical eye on that as we move forward with these efforts. Um, so nothing is really happening that's unique to SOGI. If someone claims that SOGI performs worse in surveys, do look at how other demographic categories perform in these surveys and attempts to collect data. Um, CDC and Census do incorporate SOGI across a wide range of surveys, but these aren't questions about STEM. So the American Community Survey, the Youth, youth Risk Behavioral Survey, they are tangential in, to some extent to education research, but they don't incorporate data about the experiences of people in STEM. So really it's on NCSES to um, lead the charge here. Um, to, to make sure that there are nationally representative statistics out there about um, SOGI and SGM participation. So there's a series of recommendations and best practices that have come out. Um, one is led by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, NASIM. And within that report, uh, folks in the federal government have used that report to fashion their best practices for how to collect data on SOGI in national surveys. So the U.S. Chief Statistician um, and Office of Management and Budget and Office of Personnel Management have made suggestions for what kinds of questions to ask about SOGI. So there are guidelines. Um, but overall, the experiences that many of us had in pushing for this data is a lack of responsiveness or transparency in calls for data. Um, and one of the other glaring problems, if we think about NIH, where many of us are funded by NIH or were funded by N NIH and health research, um, NIH does not define sexual and gender minorities or LGBTQ plus individuals as being underrepresented in science. They do define LGBTQ plus people as being a um, health risk population, but not um, they don't define them as being underrepresented in the STEM enterprise. Why not? Because we don't know. We don't have enough data to actually know how many people are entering STEM and persisting in STEM. So what is the proportion of the STEM workforce that does identify as a sexual and gender minority? Those of us who do this kind of demographic research probably know that um, the proportion of LGBTQI plus people is increasing because of changes in the way that demographic cohorts are identifying, but we simply don't know at this point. Um, so that means there's really almost no funding that's earmarked for interventions to study sexual gender minorities in STEM, unless you go to um, the Center for AIDS Research or um, an, a directorate that's been committed to this all along. Um, so I also mentioned that if we're talking about the definition of what's underrepresented and what that means. That has a fungible meaning. So we might think of the word underrepresented to mean uh, that based on 
the representation of LGBTQI people in the population. Underrepresented means that um, the percentage of people that are working in science is less than their proportion in the population. But that's not actually how we use underrepresented. Um, when calls for interventions research are put out, um, women, specifically white women, under the gender category are still basically considered underrepresented, even though they receive, you know, more than half of PhDs in biomedicine. There are challenges for women um, moving up the academic ladder, but the meaning of underrepresented is fairly fungible uh, as we think about what calls are put out for interventions research. So I want to debunk the argument that, well, we don't know if they're underrepresented. Um, we do know that there's probably some adverse experiences that are keeping people out of the field. Um, so is that all for this slide? Oh, and I talked about white women still being considered UR in many fields, even though they have high rates of participation. So UR is often a proxy for adverse experiences or barriers, not necessarily what's the proportion of people in this field. So I want to talk today about what I think is the most useful approach for thinking about SGM participation in STEM. And it's a developmental approach. And I mean that by stages of development within education and becoming a research scientist. So I think that this is the key to pulling together all of these puzzle pieces because we know a little bit about high school. We know a little bit about college. We know a little bit about federal employees um, in STEM fields, but we don't have a comprehensive picture of along the trajectory um, from when someone starts out identifying an interest in science to when they get their first federal grant or their first big job in STEM, what are their experiences along the way? So I am going to try to highlight some of those things based on what we do know from current research. And I'll wrap up with a sense of what do we need to do from here? So some of the things that matter in these developmental stages, like I said, when you're young, why did you become interested in science? Um, do you experience any barriers in your science classes in high school or in college? Um, and do you have a sense of belonging within STEM as you move through these developmental stages? Is there an interruption and in sense of belonging for SGM people? Those are some real important questions that we've asked for people from BIPOC populations, for instance, and that we should be asking for sexual and gender minorities as well. Um, what informs someone's decision to pursue a PhD? What are their mentorship and research experiences like? How does career thinking tape shape along the way? Um, postdoc and career decisions as they emerge um, and barriers and factors influencing decisions along the way. I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of these things see there's a lively chat going on. Um, I'm trying to ignore it while I get through my talk because I get very excited. But um, this first developmental stage that I will talk about today is high school and young adulthood. So the CDC does publish the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, and you can see by this representation of data from 2019 that LGBT or LGB boys and LGB girls are more likely to experience bullying, threats, and um, absenteeism based on fear of violence in um, high school environments. So we do know that that's there and the data are pretty dramatic. I'm going to plug a paper that um, I worked on with Brian Mustansky and our former postdoc Casey Javier Hall about um, thinking about what kinds of issues sexual and gender minority adolescents are facing in their STEM coursework and pursuing STEM in high school environments. So this paper, which we published um, a few years ago in PLOS One, was drawn from ISGEM's SMART survey, the Sexual Minority Adolescent Risk-Taking Project, HIV Prevention Program. And there are questions in there about um, how people feel in their STEM classes. So this is a survey of SGM adolescents between the ages of 13 to 18 on factors. There is a section on factors influencing STEM engagement as part of um, their screening for ongoing participation in the survey. So we took this data and asked a few questions. 
Are there differences in STEM intent across fields by gender, sex assigned at birth, and sexual identity? Is anti-SGM bullying related to sense of belonging in STEM classes and perception of STEM classroom environment being welcoming or hostile among secondary school students? And are these factors like sense of belonging and perceptions of STEM classroom climate associated with intention to enroll in STEM classes for SGM students? And I'll note that sense of belonging and perceptions of climate are things we talk about a lot in um, STEM equity research. Um, it, we may be thinking about BIPOC people, we may be thinking about gender minorities. Um, sense of belonging is um, a measure that is used commonly to gauge the experiences of people and predict whether people will continue or persist in STEM education or careers. So there were group differences we observed when we created these models and did this analysis. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, of a summary here and then go through the data a little bit more. But cis and trans women in the sample, that they're small cell sizes, did report significantly lower sense of belonging in math classes specifically compared to cis men. Um, relative to gay and lesbian identified participants, queer identified participants reported a lower sense of belonging in math class. Trans men reported significantly lower sense of belonging in STEM learning environments and lower sense of belonging of how, sorry, lower sense of how welcoming STEM is for LGBTQ people specifically. And non-binary students had a significantly lower sense of how welcoming STEM is for LGBTQ people. So these differences, I mean, the, the way they slice up, if you're gonna take this and give a summary is, yeah, for a lot of people who identify as sexual and gender minority, um, there's a significantly measured lower sense of belonging in STEM classes. So what does that all mean? Um, so sense of belonging in science is significantly correlated with intentions to enroll in a STEM field. So our research complements other research on historically underrepresented populations in STEM, that the lower sense of belonging is, um, the more likely you are to leave um, the STEM research education trajectory. And experiencing anti-SGM bullying is significantly negatively associated with sense of belonging in STEM learning environments. So you get bullied in high school um, and that tends to influence how you feel in math and science classes. The bullying may take place in those classes. Um, the exclusion may be more palpable in, in those classes as compared to social studies. Um, and when that sense of belonging goes away, the uh, desire to continue in STEM also goes away. Here we go. And experiencing anti-SGM bullying is negatively associated with perceived STEM climate. So that's another factor. And we didn't, um, we weren't able to see significance between perception of STEM climate and um, lack of intention to continue. But we do know that um, bullying and perception of STEM climate is also significant. So we do have documentation of adverse experiences um, among SGM youth in their STEM classes, specifically math. Um, that came through very strongly in this research. Um, I'll move on to college in the interest of time here, and I hope we can talk about some of this research uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, our colleague Bryce Hughes is um, one of the leading researchers in, on um, retention and persistence in science <clears throat> among LGBTQI people. Um, he's been able to use the College Senior Survey, CSS, from the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA, the Harry. Um, and he's lucky for being able to get this data. We've tried a lot and they tend to safeguard the data or not, not give it out or selectively not give it out. So we haven't had a chance um, through some of our ISGEM research to actually look at this data. But um, Bryce was interested in persistence in STEM majors until graduation um, from the start of college. And he assumed a four-year trajectory um, from the start of college until graduation. Did you stay in a STEM major? And 
Specifically, he wanted to comment on the experiences for people who are transgender and gender nonconforming. So he hones in on the college's experience, college experiences for a TGNC folks. It's a huge sample, um, over 20,000 people. Um, and the results are highly significant. So um, persistence in STEM major is lower for TGNC, LGBTQ+, and underrepresented racial and minorities. Not surprising. Um, we know that um, persistence and intention to continue are interrupted for historically underrepresented populations. Um, if you look here, um, these results are significant, but TGNC people do have a substantial struggle in this area, uh, but so do LGBTQ plus and um, historically underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities um, decide to leave STEM majors before graduation. And I wanted to also highlight what he pulls up about college experiences in STEM for um, trans and gender nonconforming students. If you look at the measures that are highly significant, feeling depressed, sought personal counseling, and demonstrated for a cause, um, TGNC people are more likely to feel depressed, seek personal counseling, and be politically active. Seeking personal counseling was significantly associated with attrition from a STEM major. But if you look at these other measures where the differences are not significant, like engaging with scientific research, um, getting into research opportunities with faculty, which is a key predictor of whether you'll go on to graduate school and succeed, as well as studying with other students and, um, well, feeling that your contributions are valued. It's not a significant measure, but you can see numeric differences there. But the point, the upshot here is that um, there's high engagement among TGNC people in STEM and negative experiences. And then we do have this measure of leaving STEM majors and seeking personal counseling for mental health issues or anxiety being significantly associated with leaving. So, um, we, we welcomed Bryce to the symposium and think tank in June. Um, his research is very valuable. Um, and this is one of the key uh, research articles on college experiences. So I hope more comes out of this. I hope there's more transparency from um, air, uh, institutes like Harry where they do have this data and it could be very useful for us moving forward. Okay, we're gonna move on. Um, on this roller coaster ride of um, STEM training and development to the graduate and postdoctoral experiences. And I'm going to go back to some of the research I have done um, with Dr. Rick McGee at Northwestern and Dr. Ida Selesky. We are part of um, a team here at Northwestern where we're engaged in this long-term qualitative longitudinal project called the National Longitudinal Study of Young Life Scientists. Um, the acronym's as long as the name, so we'll just call it the Longitudinal Study for right now. Um, but the rundown is um, we've been doing annual in-depth interviews with PhD training trainees in biomedical sciences from 2008 to the present. Uh, there were multiple waves of enrollment for people. So some people have like 12 years of or more of interviews. Some people have 10 years or more of interviews. And by now, most of our participants are past graduation. If they persisted in the PhD, you know, their assistant professor roles or in postdocs. Um, and I'm going to focus first on uh, the population of those who started PhDs. And that N was 265. And we kept them in the study until they decided to discontinue. They were lost to follow up or they selected into a non-research science career. Um, and then within that 265, I'm going to focus on 34 people. That's 13% who self-identified as a sexual or gender minority on our pre-interview surveys at least once over the course of their participation in the study. Um, so the report I'm giving reflects the most recent surveys that I've seen. Um, and our interview topics that we ask over the years um, to the same people we get to know, who we start to care about um, pretty deeply, are interests and intentions to pursue biomedicine from the very first kernel of interest that you had 
playing with dinosaurs as a kid, that kind of stuff, um, to how you picked your, your college and your PhD institution, your lab, your project choices, your mentorship experiences, your postdoc and career choices, and how your identities, your personal identities, as well as your scientific identities, impact your experiences. So I want to give you a rundown of our demographics. I'm going to talk specifically about our sexual and gender minority participants, those 34 people, 13% of our um, population who started PhDs. So um, our gender identity breakdown isn't especially diverse. It's mostly cis men and women. We do have a couple of trans women in the sample. And then our sexual identity breakdown actually is, is fairly diverse. Over the years, we've had people, ident we have a fairly comprehensive list of um, identity categories in our survey, um, as well as write-in options. But we do have a su substantial population of bisexual folks, as well as gay or lesbian, um, other non-disclosed, queer identified, pan, um, and ace, asexual. So I would say it's a fairly diverse sample in terms of, you know, SOGI elements. And on the left, we'll focus on that for one second, is racial ethnic identity. So among our SGM participants, um, mostly white, but 20% of our SGM participants who started PhDs are Black. Um, we do have a fair amount of racial diversity because the questions in the study do concern um, underrepresentation among racial ethnic minorities, which has been a pressing, urgent, ongoing problem um, in STEM and in biomedicine or you know, the whole history of the fields. Um, without, much, without much progress um, towards diversifying STEM over the last 40 years, when NIH and other institutions started to really pay attention to the diversity crisis, um, and then on the right, just to summarize the progress of our SGM participants to date, um, of those 34, eight have left their PhD program. So that's 24% of our SGM population and 3% of our total population. 17 did get PhDs. Um, that's 56 of our SGM population, 7% of total. Um, some are still in training, like postdoc training or have achieved an academic career. Um, seven received their PhDs and left academia, 21% of our SGM population, and a couple were lost to follow up. So that's our population. That's a very crude description of our population. But I want to talk about some of what this qualitative research, this mountain of qualitative research has taught us along the way. And admittedly, we've only recently started analyzing the data on sexual and gender minorities systematically. Um, we, as a research team, were also guilty of kind of ignoring that for a really long time until people started, you know, um, signaling that we really needed to start paying attention to the LGBTQI plus population in STEM. And as a member of the LGBTQI plus um, community, you know, um, taking it up and, and doing it. It's fairly urgent at the time, but all of us need to commit to it in this area of research. Um, so what are the experiences of our SGM biomedical scientists? Um, and what shapes their decision making towards persisting in science, pursuing a career in science, deciding to stay in an academic career, all of those factors? Well, you might not be surprised, but recently geographic choice of where to work um, and where to go to school has been coming up a lot. These are concrete safety issues. Um, it's not just a preference to be in a big city where there's lots of LGBTQ people. It's a safety issue considering the recent anti-LGBTQ legislation in some states. Um, but the cost of living in cities perceived as LGBTQ plus friendly is very high. So that could be a barrier in itself. Um, desire to do SGM health research, finding a place to do this work is really hard. As you heard Jagadisha when he was introducing me today, um, ISGEM is one of the largest and only um, dedicated research centers for LGBTQ plus health. These places are few and far between, and there really is no concrete mentorship or coaching around, hey, you want to do SGM health research specifically? Um, here's how I can coach you into obtaining that career and keeping your work focused on that. 
Um, we do know that there are extreme NIH funding disparities for community health research. This has been analyzed um, specifically in relation to Black scientists. Um, black scientists are more likely to pursue novel research um, overall, in general, more novel research. I read a research article about this yesterday. And to have that research be connected to community health, um, it tends to be dis devalued. And um, there's a strong prioritization for basic research among um, our within NIH and, and the funding agencies. So I do think that that would impact SGM researchers as well, you know, outside of the, the CIFAR, outside of HIV research, because community health research tends to be highly devalued in those environments. So you need a really strong, sophisticated strategy to pursue funding in this area and find a place to work. And coming out and disclosing, that's a big deal too. Um, in our interviews, we've had people express uncertainty around disclosing LGBTQI plus status. Some of that is related uh, to a lack of role models who have also come out in science, not knowing when and how to do it, um, lack of social supports, and just the utter challenge of coming out and specifically for TGNC folks transitioning while pursuing STEM education, how costly it is and um, concerns for safety and you know emotional support. So we are losing um, some of our most talented scientists. So I wanted to highlight some of the words that we've heard over the years from these amazing um, SGM scientists who participated in our longitudinal study, um, highlighting some of these concerns that I just summarized for you. So um, these are all pseudonyms, by the way. Um, so Glenn, who is a Black gay man, clinical psychologist, left um, his tenure track job told us that he'd like to work at an LGBT health center, but doesn't know how to make that happen. On the top right, Edward, who's a white gay man, who's currently an instructor, says he leans towards big cities more than his straight counterparts because those cities are more liberal and it's more comfortable to work there. I can relate. Um, the bottom left, um, Fred, a South Asian gay man who's postdoc, says he's never been part of an organization for gays and lesbians before. But it turns out when you're in a room of strangers, one thing you can bond over is if you're both gay or bi. So this social support and connectivity of uh, just the sheer value of finding other LGBTQI scientists seems to be very important. Um, I came out as trans, this is Lily, a white trans woman who left her PhD. I came out as trans to my friends and I've been moving through that pathway, but I'm not out professionally. I don't know if I will be in the future. She told us this when she was still enrolled in her PhD program. She ended up disclosing and having a fairly good experience, but I think the thing to highlight is just the high uncertainty around doing so and not knowing how she was going to be received because she, she did this and she told us in another interview that um, she had come out in all of the other social domains of her life and waited to come out in her lab and her PhD program last. So if I can offer anything from um, these qualitative interviews, it's that we have sort of genres of experience that it would behoove us to interview people about or collect survey data about because there's something there. Um, all of these things that you're looking at right now, you can think of as barriers and it's pretty easy to assign a category of experience to them. So now I think I'm doing okay with time, but um, professional, academia, industry, and government. Um, I will turn to um, sort of the authorities on this right now, Aaron Seck and Tom Wojtzunas, who um, Tom attended our symposium in June. They look at systemic inequalities for LGBTQ professionals in STEM. There's a lot here. Um, these data are highly significant. They come from a survey of scientists across 21 professional societies in STEM. So these are people who are working in all employment sectors. Um, it has a huge N of over 25,000 people. Um, and then within that, the LGBTQN is 1,006. And these results are all, again, highly significant. And just to summarize, um, LGBTQ people in the gray um, ex report experiencing um, fewer career opportunities, 
um, less resources within their STEM working environments and less comfort whistleblowing. So essentially less comfort around raising issues when someone's behaving poorly or there's discrimination or anything like that or unethical behavior. Um, they created a professional devaluation scale around, do you feel devalued in your environment? Um, LGBTQ people are more likely to say yes or to rate higher experiences of devaluation. Social exclusion, more experiences or higher perception of social exclusion. Um, very worrying here, a very significant um, likelihood of, higher likelihood of being, of experiencing harassment. <laughs> LGBTQ in STEM careers. Um, LGBTQ folks also experienced more minor health problems, insomnia, work stress, and depression, and um, are more likely to think about leaving their STEM jobs or to actively plan for it. So surveys like what SEC and Wydzunas are doing are really critical and um, they're all that's out there. And I think some of the more rigorous efforts. And since we don't have national surveys doing this work for us, where we have um, many thousands of participants, we do have to pull this data together ourselves. And um, when we do, we see pretty stark results. So <laughs> conclusions and next steps, because I feel like I've run you through the life history of this research, starting from what we know, what we don't know, who's blocking our efforts, um, what are some of our barriers? So where can we go from here? Um, yes, clearly SGM scientists face barriers and complexity at all stages of the education and training trajectory. Um, these barriers and complexities are specific to the experiences of SGM people. They may not vary completely from other historically underrepresented or minoritized groups, but we do have um, specific barriers and complexities facing um, us or I'll speak for myself, LGBTQ plus people, a community of which I am a part. Um, experiences of bullying, harassment, devaluation, and lack of resources is common in training and professional settings. Um, I will say I am a qualitatively trained sociologist. Um, that qualitative research would provide missing contextual links between survey reported barriers or just representative data, demographic data on surveys and the processes and perceptions that form SGM scientist experiences. So keep doing qualitative research, please. Um, and then where are the gaps in the data? Um, we need to structure research questions, triangulate from what we know, because like I've showed you today, we have bits and pieces across the developmental stages, um, across employment sectors. We have almost no research, apart from second wide Zunas, um, almost no research on industry, what people experience in the private sector, for example. Um, so structure our research questions around what we don't know, triangulate with what we do know. Um, federal data and funding for SGMs and STEM is imperative. I am going to say that the lack thereof or the refusal is epistemic violence. And interventions, so like um, the, the interventions for broadening participation should be designed around the collection of quantitative and qualitative data on SGM people and be responsive to known barriers. So interventions have mixed results, but we haven't had much of a chance to design interventions um, around LGBTQI plus participation. Uh, leaving a little bit of time for discussion, I want to, and this is when I freeze. Okay, this I want to thank everybody for attending. I especially want to thank um, my colleagues from the Scientific Careers Research and Development Group at Northwestern and my team at the National Science Foundation. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, for taking us through the uh, developmental stages eloquently and highlighting a lot of the really important research. Uh, one thing, you know, and I want, I want to give Christine a shout out because one thing that I was hoping that they could mention is that mm -hmm. their involvement in the STEM and some of that we had earlier this year led to their detail at NSF. So, you know, thinking about like, um, you know, giving your crops or flowers for being one of the people who's um, up and coming in the field and really um, putting this on the map and making changes. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you. All right, so uh, we have some time, so I'm going to open it up for uh, questions. 
And I know there were there was something going on in the chat. Yeah, um, I think it's commiserate. <laughs> Um, so we have Ari and Chris Barnhart from NIH. Hi, Chris. Um, this is true. Um, depending on where you apply in NIH, um, it's not a universal inclusion for SGM people under the umbrella of underrepresented. As far as I know, it's not formally. SGM people are not formally defined as underrepresented in STEM. Um, I could be missing some recent developments. Um, and I think there needs to be obviously more visibility around the the barriers that SGM people face. Thank you. Um, questions for Dr. Wood? Okay, while well, people are formulating things, um, I have a question for you. Uh, so, you know, when you talk about like Sochi data, um, you know, what would you say are some of the ways that we can promote scientific integrity um, around the collection of, of sexual orientation and gender identity data? Can you repeat that, Jagadisha? Because I accidentally um, lost my train of thought reading um, one of the chats. <laughs> oh, sure, no problem, no problem, no problem. I, I wrote it down so I can repeat thank it. You, so, thank you, thank yes. you. <laughs> um, so what are the ways that we can promote scientific integrity around uh, the collection of sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI data? Oh, what a wonderful question, my favorite question. Um, so I started off this talk talking about um, some truly noble efforts from the presidential administration right now about formulating a scientific integrity framework um, and, you know, pushing for SOGI data and pushing for the improvement of environments um, within the federal government and outside of it. But like I mentioned, I think there have been some responses I've received in bad faith when pushing people, uh, folks at NCSES, for example, on the inclusion of SOGI data other colleagues of ours have um, responded to public comments when NCSES uh, releases their planned pilot survey questions um, to less response than I would hope. So there's disappointment from people who have the resources to control what we know. And that means, you know, claiming that SOGI data don't perform well when in fact they perform as well as other demographic data. It's just that demographic data don't perform all that well in educational surveys, or they perform less well in educational surveys than a question about when you received your PhD. That's an example from the survey of earned doctorates. So when I talk about integrity and transparency, I think it's that we need to do more to consolidate our efforts around um, putting pressure in completely good faith in the spirit of collegiality on experts um, and those experts who control resources. So I do see that as being an issue when we're trying to work within the federal government space or even in academia, as I've experienced, I mentioned before, like the, um, the Higher Education Research Institute data, it being um, we, Brian um, and Casey Javier Hall and I, appealed to them to use some of their research and we filled out a whole application. We um, made a strong case for it and weren't allowed to use the data and th that's okay. They own the data, but there are experiences like that that are recurrent. And since we don't have a lot of good representative statistics, we have people like Aaron Seck getting huge awards from the NSF to do this research on her own, but we wouldn't have to replicate it as much if we had it coming from one of the national agencies, if we had it in the survey of earned doctorates to begin with. So um, we're missing the boat right now, I think, um, to, to capture some of this data now when clearly we've been able to demonstrate that there are barriers to participation. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Hi, Christine. Uh, Hi. Michael. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say something about the current the scientific consensus or lack thereof on the best way to measure um, SOGI um, and how that may or may not be an impediment to uh, getting these questions embedded in national surveys. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Michael. Um, 
So the chief statistician of the U.S. did put out a publication of best practices for how to ask SOGI questions. A lot of them did dovetail. They, they borrowed from the NASM report, but I think they were also informed by some of the current research. So the questions themselves um, are guidelines slash best practices that are fairly useful. And so they, they are what, you know, um, the chief statistician recommends that anyone doing research on SGM people um, whether they're public facing surveys like the NCSES surveys um, or surveys that are um, taking place within agencies, use these questions. But also, and this is the thing that I like the best, is in that document, they say, we want to test these questions. So go out and do this research and then come back to us and tell us what works and what doesn't. So there is this kind of discrepancy between, hey, we want you to do this. Um, coming from the administration or um, even maybe coming from research communities like ours where we're like, go do this research. We really want it done. And then when people do it or the organizations that are tasked with doing it either aren't interested in it or there's slow uptake, um, that there is a discrepancy between what's recommended and willingness to act on it and in some sense, hoarding resources in areas where there's not going to be action around this. So that's one of my big concerns now. But it is meant to be an iterative process. So um, it would behoove us to do this research and report back. Um, I think we're just stuck right now. Um, and that that's very challenging, I think. So um, there's openness to, you know, upshot is there's openness to revision and comment from those putting out guidelines and best practices, but there's disorganization and differing opinion as to how important it is from um, research institutions and organizations that have the power to do it. Other questions? Yes, please. Hey, Christine. It's Morgan. Hi, Hi Morgan. Hey. Um, so... I'm wondering to what extent that there is an interest in actually collecting more data on those who have earned a PhD but have moved outside of academia, not in such a way in which they have necessarily been pushed out, um, but especially from STEM fields that they've taken a PhD and have wanted to work at organizations that potentially are paying them a lot better or creating different environments. Like I know the citations that you have provided coming from Aaron and colleagues, um, so the Czech and colleagues, um, touch upon that a little bit, but especially as you're discussing collecting these data from things like earned doctorate surveys and other longitudinal surveys, to what extent is this kind of just a discussion among your colleagues about looking at ways in which potentially private industry is mitigates some of the issues that academia seems to replicate. Oh, thank you so much, Morgan. I mean, that that's a fascinating question. Like I said, um, there aren't um, research efforts looking specifically at people working in industry. I think obviously SEC and White Zunas do look at people um, across STEM sectors, but aren't very specific about what sector they're in. So we don't have, um, you know, stratified responses based on, oh, academia, government, industry. And you're absolutely right. And from my own qualitative research, that industry is very appealing to people because um, you could probably go work in a city where there's a high proportion of LGBTQ plus people and you get paid a lot. Um, so even if you have reservations about um, contributing to the capitalist machine as part of your science, it's a pretty nice quality of life. So um, I would be very interested in any study that looks at people who either received a STEM degree and went to do research in industry or consulting that related to their degree or left science or research science completely. And I hear what you're saying about this isn't really necessarily a question about feeling pushed out, but much like the qualitative research that we're doing where people are telling us, I'm not going to leave science, but I have a very specific set of concerns that are going to dictate my decisions. I think that's the sweet spot for really, really doing good sociological 
work on this beyond the descriptive statistics that we get from NCSES and others. So it's a why behind the what in some ways. Um, and it's an exploration of when people trade off maybe some some of their ideals that they had at the beginning about um, making a major contribution, say, to sexual health, and then deciding to use their skills elsewhere um, so that they can actually make some money and retire someday. Um, so, that, I mean, you, you kind of, your question kind of posed a, <laughs> a research question for the future that I think is very worthwhile. Thank you, Christine. So uh, we've got less than a minute left. Any really quick questions? And uh, you're getting lots of love in the chat. Um, well, okay. very gracious comments. Um, well, if anyone, no one has questions, I mean, please feel free to reach out to me or email me if there's any discussion um, around this. I it's, you know, kind of the the hill I'm going to fight on right now is to improve the collection of SOGI data, especially in, from organizations where there are lots of resources to do it. All right, so can we get uh, Dr. Wither back to the pot? All right, so with that, let's conclude. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here in person and folks joining us online. Uh, we invite you to come back next month where we'll be having a presentation by Ishim's own um, Implementation Science Coordination Initiative. Um, and I believe it's January 25th, right? Okay. Thank you, and uh, take care, everyone, and happy holidays. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.